think we are going to get started. Uh, I want to welcome everyone here to the uh, District Administration Center in Liberty Public Schools. My name is Dallas Ackerman. I'm on Director of Communication and Marketing. And you're here because this is our monthly series copy with the community, uh, an opportunity for us to educate our uh, parents and patrons about the various happenings uh, taking place in, in LPS and, and this month. Definitely a, an important topic to cover is we have the election coming up, the 36 cent levy issue on November 5th, and we are fortunate enough to be joined by Dr. John Jungman, our superintendent. This is actually the kickoff of five of our community meetings that will be taking place in the next several weeks. Um, next week, on the week of the 15th, we will have two, one at Liberty High School on Tuesday, October 15th from 7 to 8 p.m. and then at Liberty North High School on the 17th from 7 to 8. We will be here at the District Administration Center on Thursday, October 24th. And then we will have a special meeting during the day, a chance for, for folks to attend on uh, Wednesday, October 30th, just before the election. That will be from 11.30 to 12.30 at the Liberty Community Center and uh, before you leave, if you have not received one of these, and I'll actually pass these around uh, as Dr. Jungman gets started, but this is uh, an informational flyer that you can have, and it includes all the dates coming up in the next few weeks. So with that, I will turn it over to our superintendent, Dr. John Jungman, to take us through today's presentation. Thanks so much, Dallas. Uh, and thank you uh, for those of you who gave up your morning to be here and those of you watching on TV uh, on the tape delayed version. Uh, just an opportunity to give you a state of the district. Uh, the majority of the state of the district is going to really go around this uh, levy proposal because our goal right now is just providing information to the entire community. Uh, this presentation's probably been given 30 plus times between cabinet members, board members, and myself. Uh, and we hope to continue to give, uh, give it between now and November 5th so everybody has clear information. Also, in the state of the district, I'm going to hit on a few student performance pieces. I'm going to hit on a few budget pieces, but the, the big lot of the time will be around the upcoming levy question, uh, and we'll have some time at the end to clarify and answer any questions that you may have. So we'll get rolling. This is about a 30-minute presentation. If you have questions, uh, try to write them down. Uh, if, you, if it's something that you don't think you'll remember, feel free to interrupt me, and we'll address it and then move right on. But about 30 minutes, uh, inspire, invest, and innovate is kind of the slogan we've been looking uh, living under for the last few months, uh, and we think it really uh, matches where we're trying to go with Liberty Public Schools. Uh, I think it's important before we start going that we remember where we have been in the past. Liberty Public Schools is an, an incredibly rich tradition performance school system with great programming, uh, and performance has played well. I'm standing in front of banner after banner of accreditation with distinction. Uh, this district has a rich tradition, and we want to continue that. So we want to continue to celebrate our past, but we also want to plan for the future uh, because the kids that are in our schools right now, the, it's all about the future. It's about today and tomorrow. How do we make sure? Or we're ready for uh, the future that is coming for them. As we think about the future, it's important that we look at the present. And this is a student performance kind of piece that we want to talk about today. Student performance uh, for Liberty Public Schools has always been high. Uh, but I would tell you, as compared to state averages, it should always be high. And that's what we've all often looked at. When we looked at state averages, Liberty Public Schools has a very significant demographic advantage over the state. Uh, so we've uh, kind of turned it for the last uh, 12 months and started having conversations about quit looking at state averages, look at two different groups, look at who are the best school districts in the state of Missouri, and look at your peers. And your peers aren't state averages, so we've identified peer groups. Uh, this, the way we do that is demographics, size, urbanicity, there's a couple other factors, and it's a research method uh, that Christopher Hand uh, uses and identified these eight school districts as our peers. Uh, Blue Springs, Kearney, Ladue, Lee Summit, Lindbergh, Park Hill, Parkway, and Rockwood. And to be honest, we're in the middle of expanding that peer group to a group of 15. Uh, so there'll be seven districts on each side. Uh, we don't have all the data compiled yet, but right now there's four districts on each side of the state that are kind of suburban type districts uh, that match demographics uh, to Liberty Public Schools. And so I'm gonna show you a little bit of student performance data and how we're doing as compared to our peers. 
Before we get to the actual data, I think it's important that you know why do we use this peer group. And demographics is the number one. We'll start with enrollment. Enrollment ranges from 3,500 to 22,000. Kearney being the smallest school, Rockwood being the largest school. We fall basically right in the middle. Uh, the last year's enrollment just under 11,300. So they're all big districts in the state of Missouri if you want to uh, think about how the districts, there's over 500 districts in the state. These would all be in the top 50 size-wise, so they're all large districts. Free and reduced rate, which is a measure of poverty uh, within a community. It's how many of your students qualify for free and reduced lunches. Uh, we are at 21.1%. The average of our peer groups is 20.3%, and this is one of the significant reasons that we say we're not like the state, because if you looked at the state average, it's over 50% of, of students uh, qualify for free and reduced across the state. Now, if you looked at just the high-performing districts in the state of Missouri, the last time accreditation with distinction was awarded, that number was nearly 39%, I think it was 38.8% free and reduced students in high performing districts. So once again, our district uh, is significantly advantaged when it comes to the population that walks in our doors. Uh, so that's why we can't just compare ourselves to state averages and we need to look at our peer group. This peer group you see looks like us. It often looks like us in demographics. Some have more diversity, more fairly, fairly homogeneous, uh, but uh, we have some diversity, but very limited. Uh, I think the state of Missouri is probably pretty limited as a whole, so you're not gonna see a ton across the state. So there's a little demographic background for Liberty Public Schools and our peers. So let's look at our performance versus that peer group on this year's state assessments. We gave 19 tests that are comparable across uh, between district to district of those no and state, and we get of those 19 tests in communication arts, math, science, and social studies, we're above state average in all of them. So all 19, once again, we're above state average. However, when we flip the conversation, we talk about our peer group, that, average, that uh, data looks different. Uh, now 16 of those 19 tests were actually below our peer group average. So, we have room for improvement. Now, are we light years below? No, uh, we're fractions in some, a little bit more in uh, some others, but that's not acceptable. I don't think to our community, to our staff, to our kids, that we're below our peers average on 16 of those 19 exams. These are students who are gonna have to go compete for scholarships and jobs uh, with all of their peers across the state, and we need to make sure that they are prepared. So we have room for improvement, I think is the message. Also on ACT, uh, we're above uh, our peer average in percent tested because we started testing the entire group. 98% of our uh, juniors and seniors have taken the ACT at this point. The state average is under 70%. Okay, uh, we're right about state average for our score, but we're also testing 30% more kids, and that's always going to drive down your ACT score. Last year, before we moved to all kids testing, we were well above state average, almost two points above state average, and we were right about our peer average, but we knew when we started testing all kids uh, that it would drive our averages down. Now we know, uh, and we can identify weaknesses uh, and opportunities for improvement. Uh, and help all kids be college and career ready. We know that not all are going to go, but we want all to have the option and to be prepared so that if they choose, they're not going into remedial courses. And that's our goal is to get our scores up to high enough levels that our kids don't leave here needing remediation when they walk into whatever that next thing is, whether that be on the job or in college. So this is giving us good information. Graduation rate is the uh, kind of the big one for me because that I see the graduation as the starting line for life for kids. And if they're not able to get across that starting line, uh, they're gonna have a hard time uh, having success in the years to come. So graduation rate for Liberty Public Schools is just over 90%. It's went up three straight years. That's a great trend. What I would tell you as compared to our peer average though, we're about 3% below peer averages up 93.5 to 94%. Uh, so we have some room for improvement again. Uh, we've set a goal to increase that by at least 1% a year uh, from here on until we get that up to uh, what we think is acceptable. And obviously we want all kids to graduate. So graduation rate, another thing that we're doing well as compared to state, but not as well as our peers and we have room for improvement. So we're gonna target some things that will help make that happen. The other thing, not just looking at our peers, but who are the best districts in the state of Missouri and how are we doing as compared to them? We took those 19 tests and we made one composite overall score. And that composite uh, ranked us 20th on an, in an index 
as compared to 193 school districts with over 1,000 kids. So we basically said, what are all the largest school districts? 1,000 or more, there's 193 districts uh, that fit that classification. We were 20th with an index of 383.2. In our peer group, we defeated Kearney, uh, or we defeated Lee Summit, who was 24th. We're just a fraction below Kearney at 18th, Blue Springs at 12th, and then the other five lie in the top 10. Okay, so the good news is the peers that we've identified are the best districts in the state of Missouri when it comes to high performance. And we're not far off the mark. Uh, we're basically in the top 10%. Several of them are right there with us. A few are in the top 5%. So if we continue to benchmark ourselves off of that peer group and try to uh, prepare our kids uh, to compete with those students, I think we're right where we need to be. Uh, so uh, Room for improvement, we've identified the right peers and we've identified the best districts in the state of Missouri. Now it's just getting to work and seeing what we can do to make that happen. How do we do it? Well, we have to, uh, you know, as a board and as a leadership team, we have to think about how do we distribute our resources in order to make performance improve. And so I wanna show you a little bit about what Liberty Public Schools spends their money on right now. Uh, where do our resources go? This is a big system. Uh, you, uh, if you've been in the community very long, you've known it's grown uh, significantly. We have 1,500 staff members. That includes teachers, uh, custodians, cooks, bus drivers, administration, support staff, over 1,500 employees. They represent 81% of the operating budget. The operating budget is somewhere in the uh, range of $115 million. They represent four out of every $5 goes to our people. $130 million is our total budget. We have uh, a chunk of that. If you look at the pie, obviously the salaries and benefits piece is $93 million. You've got debt service and uh, lease purchase, which is about $13 million or just over 10% of our budget. That's paying off what I would call the mortgage. Okay, that's paying off the buildings that we've built in the past. Capital projects piece, that's a small sliver of the pie. That's replacing roofs, uh, heating and air units, things that break during the year, uh, flooring, those kind of things that need to replaced, be replaced over time, very small piece. And then materials and supplies and purchase services uh, make up about 17% of the budget. And that's just not textbooks and paper and technology, that's also fuel in the buses, food in the cafeteria, the, the bill to pay the light bill, uh, all the utilities pieces. So that makes up a significant piece of the budget also. But it's important to remember, even with all of those things, you can look at the pie, and that's the entire $130 million budget. The majority of our spending goes towards our people business uh, that we, uh, we pay to have people come and serve your students. So how do we compare to our peers when we look at budget? The best way to do that uh, is always kind of the per pupil expenditure. So if you look in column two here, expenditures per ADA, that's your average daily attendance. Liberty's uh, spending last year was just under $9,300 per child. If you look at the peer average, it's about $9,700. Uh, we've got Blue Springs at 86, Kearney at 76, Lee Summit at 89, Lindbergh 95, you, you can uh, Park Hill at 10-1. Uh, so you can see we're right in the middle. I think there's four below and four above. Uh, there are a couple that I would call outliers a little bit. Uh, Ledoux and Parkway uh, probably push the averages up a little bit because they have an incredibly rich tax base uh, that allows them to spend at a little more aggressive rate. But one, one thing that's important to note for our pupil, per pupil expenditure, uh, a chunk of that comes from local and a chunk of that comes from the state, the, the two biggest pieces. Assess valuation is how our local taxes are driven. Our total value of all the houses, retail, real estate, personal property in Liberty Public Schools is $861 million. Now, if you break that down on a per child basis, you're going to see that we have the lowest uh, at $76,329 of assess valuation behind each child as compared to our peers. Uh, Blue Springs at 86,000, Kearney at 83, and then you see the numbers just escalate from there. So we have a low assessed valuation per child as per our peer group. Why that's important is the next slide when we start talking about our levy and how much money is generated per child uh, locally as compared to our peers. So here that is. We've got two columns uh, that talk about our debt service and our total levy. So our debt service is that kind of that real estate, that uh, paying off the mortgage payment. And then your total levy includes that as well as your operating. So at 609, which is our current levy, uh, we're the second highest. Lee Summit is at 610 as compared to our peers. What's unfortunate, even though we have the second highest levy, we generate the second fewest dollars. Okay, so $4,652 are generated locally per child with our 609 levy. If you look down amongst our peers, Blue Springs has a levy that's 30 cents less 
they generate $300 more per child. Carney, even, even with a 80 cent less or 90 cent less levy is generating just $300 less. So if they were running the same levy, they'd be generating much more than we are. Important to note that districts like Lee Summit, that's running the same levy basically, one penny different, that's generating $1,000 more per child locally right now. And our no other neighbor uh, in the region, Park Hill, who has a levy that's 70 cents less than ours, is generating th nearly $3,000 more locally per child, $7,400. Uh, so that's an, uh, that's, that is an issue of assessed valuation and local property wealth behind each child that really puts some districts at an advantage of what they're able to do and taxpayers at a disadvantage, to be honest, because uh, they have to tax themselves at a much higher rate to provide the same kind of quality uh, product. Now, the way it's supposed to work, just so you know, is the state's supposed to help come in and offset. It's called a foundation formula. So they're supposed to guarantee that all kids have the opportunity for a quality education. Now, they won't take it up to the highest spending district in the state, but it's called, what a, it's called a state adequacy target that we, uh, they try to uh, provide this much money behind each child. So the state has a formula that helps uh, offset the differences. The bad news is the state has not been able to fund their formula uh, for quite some time. So right now, we're underfunded by just over 7%. That results for Liberty, and you see the state shortfall column of $3.7 million in funding that is not coming our way. That's $328 per child. This is kind of where the double whammy hits, that if you're, you have high assessed valuation and you can generate a lot locally, uh, you don't depend on the state as much. So when you get cut by the state, all those other districts get state money too and they're being cut, but their percentage of uh, impact on the kid is much smaller because they don't depend on it as much. So if you look at Blue Springs, their reduction per child is only 253. If you look at Park Hill, their reduction per child is only 186. If you look at some Kansas, or St. Louis districts like Parkway, their reduction per uh, child is only $38. So the impact of the state not being able to fund the formula is very uh, much reduced when you have a high assessed valuation uh, per child. So. That kind of puts us in a difficult situation and it, it leads to some of the difficult conversations about what do we do with our levy uh, and the decision of the board to put the levy proposal in front of the uh, voters this this coming month actually so that gives you a little bit of finance projection or finance background now let's look at the enrollment side because obviously that affects budget on an annual basis where are we today? Uh, Liberty Public Schools is right about 11,600 kids, and you can see the K-5, 6, 8, uh, 9, 12 breakdown. Uh, we are over capacity at the elementary and the, sec and the high school level. Uh, we have a little bit of capacity at the middle level because of the reconfiguration. Uh, the bad news is, as you see that chart, based on our projections of growth, that capacity will be soon um, sucked up, basically. They will fill in those classrooms that are open. Right now we have 40 classrooms. Uh, we have 20 uh, modular units with a total of 40 classrooms where we have kids outside uh, of permanent structures. So we have a th nearly 1,000 kids. We're at 11,600 total enrollment and we're projected to reach over 14,000 by 2020-21. Uh, so three to 350 kids coming our way. That, coupled with our budget uh, issues, leads the board to really do some research about what do we do differently and how do we prepare for the future. So what, uh, what are our real challenges? Uh, you see it right there, it's an enrollment growth and how do we provide adequate education when there's not state funding increases and really there's not much local funding increases. We did some data analysis on what does it look like for the future as we continue to grow? Uh, what are the projections? What we found out uh, were kind of startling. You know, if we tried to recreate the system that we have right now and buy the same number of people per child that we have right now, that's buses, bus drivers, cooks, custodians, teachers, administrators, in 2020 as 2,500 kids come our way and we just provide, tried to provide the same benefit and salary structure of rolling our schedule, same benefit structure uh, for those new people that would be necessary to educate those 2,500 students, the levy increase for operations only would be nearly $3. Uh, obviously that is unrealistic, you see it on the slide, unrealistic, unaffordable, nothing you would vote for, nothing I would vote for, that's, that's unachievable. Uh, also on the same thing, 
square footage. So if we've tried to build the same amount of square footage per child that we have in the system right now, between now and 2020, of those 2,500 kids come our way, the total cost of that would be somewhere in the range of $95 million projected. Uh, that's, you know, if you follow the traditional model of every time 600 kids show up, you build an elementary. Every time eight to 900 show up, you build a middle school. And every time uh, you get over 1,500 to 2,000, you start investigating and building another high school. If we follow that traditional Missouri model, the cost projection is about $95 million. Uh, the bad news is that's just the building site, right? The operation is the big piece. If you remember back to the original budget picture, four out of every $5 goes into the operations. What's the message? Uh, period. We've got to do our work differently if we're going to continue to exist. That plan does not play out. It's not affordable. Uh, and it's not something uh, that we even feel comfortable having a discussion with the voters about because that, that's not going to play. Uh, so we need to think differently about how we do our work. How does our work change? Uh, necessity is the mother of invention. I love that. And this is a necessary time for Liberty Public Schools to reinvent, rethink about time and space, rethink about how we use our staff, uh, and make sure that we're preparing kids in a very effective way, but in the most efficient way possible, because our taxpayers aren't going to be able to afford to buy the model we've got. Some of the things that we've uh, kind of led our slogan and uh, kind of some goals around this are, you know, it goes back to that inspire, invest, and innovate. Number one, we've got to continue to inspire our kids to leave here and do tremendous things. We have a reputation for that. That's why people move to this community, and that's why they stay in this community. Our schools have to continue to inspire great performance. They have to prepare kids for college and career of the future, not of yesterday. So we have to continue to push ourselves to think outside of the box of how we do our work so that our kids are prepared. Number two, the way that, number one way we do that is attract, develop, and retain high quality people. If we choose to say that we're going to solve our budget problems by reducing uh, who we attract and how we uh, you know, train up the people and what we do to retain those people, I think that has devastating impacts on the public school system in Liberty. So number two is always, uh, is always it's really number one, if you don't have good people, high quality teacher in every classroom, uh, your system uh, will decrease in its performance rapidly. So attract, develop, retain high quality faculty, leadership, and support staff. Number three, we've got to invest in innovative practices and technology. Uh, most industries have changed in the last 20 years. Uh, education is probably one of the slowest to change. If you look at classrooms today versus classrooms 10 years ago, 20 years ago, the typical one that you walk into across the state of Missouri and probably in Liberty Public Schools doesn't look much different than it did then. Uh, we're still using textbooks and pen and paper. We're not using technology uh, to meet the needs of our students very effectively. Uh, we are going to have to change some of the things that we do, and technology has got to be a piece of that puzzle. Implement, implement facility practices that really uh, change our, the shape of how we use space. Uh, reduce our square footage per learner uh, so that we can control all of those dollars and shove them towards instruction. Those are the most important spending. So how do we control facility uh, acquisition cost, basically, so we can uh, direct all those dollars into the classroom? The board set some, uh, well, this is one thing that's been done already. This ran through Vision 2020, our community stakeholder group last year, as we thought about uh, how do we begin to te use technology difference. This is different. This is just one of those examples. Liberty Leads, uh, the one-to-one -one environment at both high schools that's been rolled out. It's allowing us to reshape time already. We've captured classrooms back for, uh, for teaching instead of event space for labs. Mobile technology in the hands of every kid is expanding how we do learning. It's also allowing us to think differently about some of our courses and blended environments where kids may not meet every day at the same time. Uh, so we can actually capture more of our space more effectively. We've got hallways, we've got classrooms, we've got auditoriums, we've got spaces in our buildings that aren't used very efficiently. So how do we turn those into instructional spaces? And a great example of this, if you haven't been out to uh, William Jewell to see their new prior learning commons, is an example of how you think about space differently and how kids can learn in different spaces that aren't just boxes of concrete blocks with a teacher standing in front. Uh, they want to learn in different environments. How do we set up those environments and use our spaces a little differently? So Liberty Leads is just a beginning step of having conversations about how we use technology differently. And we're starting with some of our high school kids. So this has led to a long-term discussion. Actually, it started before I got here, a facility master planning. After the uh, 2011 uh, 11 levy uh, failed, the board kind of went back to the drawing board and said, OK, we've heard from the community uh, that this didn't meet all the needs, uh, and we need to redesign. 
So they went back, they have worked with uh, some outside consultants. They've worked with our community stakeholder groups, Vision 2020. Uh, we've gotten a lot of feedback from uh, community as well as internal staff, uh, teachers and administrators and support staff, surveys across the community. Went through a 12 month process to redesign the facility master plan. And it's really not just about the levy, it's about long range. What does this have to look like long range? Not just step one, but step two uh, down the road. So they've come up with a new plan and it's built on these three uh, basic goals. Number one, look at your current space. Uh, you have to maximize use of current space. That's our best asset. We have over 2 million square feet uh, of space in this system right now. So how can we take advantage of that space differently? So that's number one. Number two, as we build, build differently. Don't necessarily build by the pattern that has been built in the past and the traditions of public schools. Because uh, our goal is to reduce actually our square footage per learner by 10% by 2020. And number three, research and implement new instructional learning scheduling practices that allow us to use that space and time differently. This allows number one and two to happen. If we just say we're gonna box them in, we're gonna shove more in a classroom, that's not what we're getting at, and that's not gonna be more effective. This is about thinking outside the box, okay, uh, pardon the pun, about how we think differently about instruction, about time, about learning, and we've re uh, researched and been to different sites and we're seeing this happen. Uh, so the space that we build uh, and the conversations that we have are always around how do we get more effective and how do we use space and time differently and how do we make sure that learning is increasing along the way. Uh, this is not going to sacrifice performance. So with those three goals, they came up with a master plan. And I know you can't see this. It's fine print on the screen if you want to see it blown up. I encourage you to go to board docs. You can see this document in full color and with all the details. But I'll tell you what's in it uh, in just a minute because I've broken it down into a few different slides. But it's really a facility master plan that has the goals that I just mentioned in the top right corner. And then it's got three components. It's got phase one, which is uh, what's in levy. Uh, in the levy for November, six, or November 5th. It's got phase two, which would happen in 2017, 2018, approximately based on what growth happens uh, between now and then. And then it's got a supplemental projects that are outside of phase one and phase two. Uh, those would be uh, funded privately, which could include a stadium, could include turf on fields, could include some of those things that all the other districts around us actually have. Uh, but we uh, are focusing all of our dollars and our ask at the taxpayer to really uh, things that impact the instructional environment on a daily basis. So that's what we're uh, really trying to target these dollars around. Those are still needs and things that we think uh, that we want to uh, try to make happen, but they've been put in a supplemental uh, outside of tax funding uh, column on the facility master plan or row, I, I guess I would say. So let's get after that. Levy, so what's in that phase one? Number one, it's 36 cents. That the board uh, discussed how much uh, is the right number to ask for. Uh, they feel like we can get, if not all of the projects, the overwhelming majority of the projects that are done in phase one for a 36 cent levy increase. Uh, they approved that unanimously uh, at our August 19th meeting and that question will be before the voters on November 5th. The big, uh, as we get into what's in it, is why now? So why is now the right time? Well, number one, like we talked about, the state formula is underfunded. This is filling the gap for over $4 million, 3.7 in the formula, and then there's hundreds of thousands of dollars of transportation money that is being withheld also. So this is filling the gap for the $4 million of withholdings that we're experiencing from the state. Number two, uh, we're at 11,600 kids. We've got 1,000 kids in modular classrooms, and we're going to grow uh, to well over 14,000 by 2020. And number three, and I haven't mentioned this a whole lot uh, earlier in the presentation, but it's important to know that the assessed valuation in the district right now, that $861 million I talked about, is actually lower than it was in 2008. So we've grown by 1,000 kids. We've added houses. We've added businesses in the last five years, but we haven't added a lot of local uh, revenue because assessed valuation dropped due to the eco economy. Uh, we do see that hopefully kicking back uh, and turning, uh, but right now uh, we have not seen any new local dollars. The only new dollars that are coming into the system right now are the dollars that come with each new child that enrolls and they come from the state, and that's a fraction of what's necessary to educate the, uh, the to provide the education in Liberty Public Schools. So that's why now. So what's in the plan? 
Once again, it's a redesign from new buildings to additions to buildings. Uh, the 20 modular classrooms uh, would hopefully go away relatively quickly. Some of the sites would be Kellybrook, Lewis and Clark, Shoal Creek, and Warren Hills. Three of those four buildings already have mobile classrooms. Lewis and Clark would be getting some next year if we don't get an addition put onto it. So this would be additions at each of those sites of just regular classrooms. Uh, also, classroom space at Liberty Middle School. This one will be on the borderline. Uh, hopefully bids come in good so we can get three or four classrooms at Liberty Middle School. It's the only middle school that needs anything space-wise between now and phase two. Uh, they are near capacity right now. Uh, classroom space, science labs, and track at Liberty North. If you've been by that site, you obviously know that we have 11 modulars there. Uh, a lot of classrooms taken taking place outside of the structure. This would get one wing. Uh, the previous plan had two wings. This would get one wing now and then another wing come back in 2017, 18 uh, to try to get that. So a lot of space being added at Liberty North. In addition, uh, talking about using our space differently, it would actually take the building that we're standing in and turn it into an elementary site. Uh, this building uh, has the potential to house three to 400 students, we believe, and we have two floors in Blue Jay Tower that have been housed by Northwest in the past. Uh, while it's been a good relationship, they've been a good tenant, we need that space. Uh, we cannot uh, have tenants at this point. We need to have our people occupying the space. So we'd take our district office and move it into first, third, and fourth floor at Blue Jay Tower, uh, relocate the Liberty Academy, and then open this site uh, for three to 400 students uh, for a, an 11th elementary. That is the most efficient way. We can do this at a fraction of the cost of building another site uh, for those three to 400 kids. It would basically uh, be an overflow site. It would be voluntary enrollment and it would draw from across the district. Provide additional space for student wellness, fitness, and competition by constructing a gym at Liberty High. One of the consequences of moving into a nine through 12 system, while it's got a, a number of great benefits, all those freshmen that used to be able to get their PE credits at the junior highs now are at high schools. Uh, so the number, of require, or the number of credits needed in physical education has went up at both schools, and there's not enough space. We already had small space. Uh, at Liberty High School when it came to uh, wellness and fitness and competition, this provides a second gym. It would also be a competition gym. This is not Liberty North's field house, a replication of that. It would not be that big, uh, but it would be big enough to house uh, varsity events as well as sub varsity events. And the most important thing is we think by the way we're designing it, it gets us four to five classrooms. Uh, by the way, you can divide up the courts, uh, and use the space uh, that's not just in the build in the gym, but uh, right next to the gym. We think we can get four to five PE classrooms uh, as part of this addition. Provide technology upgrades and enhancements for K-8 students and staff. Obviously, Liberty Leeds has uh, made a significant push at the high school level. Uh, the next step is we obviously want to do some of those things at the K-8 level so that they're prepared to walk into our high school environments that are technology rich uh, and really match the homes that they're living in and the things that they're bringing to school on a daily basis. So provide technology upgrades. This isn't a one-to-one -one environment for K-8, but it would be a sub substantial investment in our middle school and elementary programs to uh, upgrade the technology they have and enhance it with additional pieces. Safety and security upgrades. Any of the sites that we have, our goal uh, is to get a secured uh, access point entryway where people have to walk through the office before they enter the building. Any of the sites that we touch as part of any of these projects, uh, we would upgrade that entryway to try to get it to that, uh, that status where you have to actually walk through the office before entering the building. So uh, some safety and security upgrades are also included. How's it different? I have that question uh, brought so, because historically, I can't remember what's in 2011. So tell me how this is different than 2011. Number one, uh, it's 16% smaller. The, the last ask was 43 cents. This one's 36 cents. So seven cent reduction, 16% reduction in the ask. It reduces the overall projected cost. If we'd have followed the model that was in place in the 2011 and continued with that model into 2020, uh, that model would have been 37% more expensive than the project, the facility master plan phasing project that we've put together here. So it's a reduced scope. It's reduced cost, not just short term, but also long term. It removes the district stadium component while it's still a need and it still remains on the facility master plan as a private fund. Uh, it has been shifted to private fundraising and it uh, is not being asked to be paid for by the taxpayers on the levy. 
Overall, the biggest thing is it, it's really a, a concerted effort to think about controlling operational costs so that those monies can be rolled into the classroom. Uh, it phases in the need over seven years, so phase one now. Uh, we don't build out and grow for seven years. We build out what we need right now, and then we build again uh, in about five years. Restructure space usage at all facilities. Uh, so I've already talked about how we're using space different at both of the high schools, middle schools, elementary schools. We're going to capture, recapture technology or technology labs by using mod, mobile mobile technology and think differently about how we use space that's not used every minute of every day. We've got to capture that space for more efficient use. And it calls for no immediate boundary changes. The great thing about reconfiguration is it put in a feeder system that is uh, that I think is very good for Liberty Public Schools, it allows our elementary entries to feed into middles and those middles to feed into highs uh, allows uh, really uh, kids to identify with one school system you know, with one high school track I think it really uh, is going to unify our community around our two high schools uh, and this allows that to play out we don't have to ship, shift boundary changes here in two or three years or five years this can play out for seven years with no changes What's the impact? So what does all this cost? 36 cents, sometimes it's hard for us to understand what's that mean to me as a taxpayer. The 36 cents uh, for every $100 of real, and per, uh, real or personal property uh, is best articulated this way. If you had a $200,000 house and a $20,000 car or $20,000 in personal property, you'd have $220,000 total of property wealth. That would be $161 per year approximately in increased taxes, or $13.50 per month in increased taxes on a $220,000 property value. Obviously, if you have more, do the multiplication. If you have less, do the division. Uh, but that gives you an approximate of where you would lie and what the impact would be on me. So that's the taxpayer impact. Uh, the, once again, the overall goal of this uh, communication, as well as the other four events that are coming, uh, going to happen in the next few weeks, is just to get the word out, answer questions. Our job as a district is just to provide you with the facts. Uh, and we want to make sure those facts are clear, and uh, we want to be here as a resource. So if you have any questions now, uh, I, number one, I'd encourage you to hit this website. If you haven't uh, been there, liberty.k12.mo.us. It has a small button in the bottom right-hand corner that says, number, I think it says November 5th election. If you go to there, you'll see FAQs list, uh, uh, frequently asked questions. You'll also see this video. Uh, you'll see a shortened version if you don't want the long version, if you just want to uh, see the 10-minute version. Uh, you'll also see the board's announcement and some other information, the flyer that, that we've given out to you this morning. All of those pieces of information are available on the district website. So if you're watching and saying, I, I don't want to go watch 30 minutes, but I uh, uh, watch that again, uh, but I have more questions, go to that site. I think the majority of your questions can be answered there. If not, there's a way to seek feedback. Uh, so send Alice questions, send me questions. We'd love to uh, help answer any questions that you may have. So that, that is basically everything that I have for this morning, but I do want to provide the audience an opportunity to uh, ask questions and see if there's anything that I can clarify for you. Kent? When we get to the end of the, the two-phase plan, mm -hmm. we look four or five years down the road, yep. um, is, our, is our vision that we will have uh, some excess capacity in the school, in the school system yeah. in, in 2017, 2018, or around? No. Will, will we see those disappear? The, yeah. those the modules that you must disappear, do we think yeah. we'll have some capacity built in to yeah. handle any future growth paths? To yeah. Future? Really, the, the plan design is not to overbuild at any point. So there, there is not excess capacity basically built beyond, okay, phase one gets us out to 2017, 18. We can measure our growth at that point. Kind of got a phase two planned at this point. That will adjust, obviously, based on what enrollment comes. And then we go and build for the next three or four years. So it's a small phased plan. Uh, it's not going to build capacity into the system. Uh, the, modulars we're trying to get rid of, but I've told people from day one, they're going to be a part of our growth plan no matter what. We're going to have to use one here, use one there, uh, because the amount of money that it would take for us to ask the community to build out so that would never be a part of our growth plan, I think it's just unaffordable, uh, and I'm not sure it's good use of taxpayer dollars. So a little one here, a little one there, it's going to be part of the plan as we phase this in, uh, and we're not building capacity. We're just trying to take care of the ones we've got, 
plus the ones that are coming in the very immediate future and then look at it again. This plan, I've told people from day one, it is a working plan. This is a model that says this is what we believe to be projected out. It will be reviewed annually by the board to say, okay, phase one did take care of this, but phase two is going to have to adjust. It may have to move up, may have to move back a couple years, uh, but that's kind of the way it's going to play out. Good question. Others? Yes. Um, first, I have great admiration for the school board, the staff, administration. Yeah. Uh, out of uh, many op options for my family to select 23 years ago, we chose yeah. Liberty and principally for the school district. Good. Yeah. Um, and have been real proud of it ever since then. Currently got five grandchildren in the district. Wonderful. Um, two questions. Number one is on the state underfunding. Mm -hmm. um, I know dealing with state government is, <laughs> you know, like a Ouija board. <laughs> it's the, not uh, as bad uh, as federal. Let's put it that way. That's good. <laughs> it's not as bad as federal. <laughs> They're at least local, and we can have a little more impact. I wonder what the best outlook is on the uh, closing of the gap. The other yeah. Company. Yeah. That was one question. Right. I have a second one uh, having to do with uh, what currently, what current activities does a district and a board have underway with the city of Liberty uh -huh. promoting more commercial growth and mm -hmm. obviously building the tax base? Yeah, great. Two perfect questions uh, that really think about long term what's the impact of this and what's the taxpayer, what's the tax base going to look like in the future, uh, both from the state and from the local level. So what number one on the state uh, picture, what I would tell you is there was a new formula put in place historically about 2006 and the state was underfunding the old formula. So they put in a plan to put in about $100 million a year for seven years uh, to get us to full funding. So they had a great plan. And uh, that was actually right on track until the economy tanked. And about 2008, 2009, whenever it began to tank, the growth was happening, the money was coming in, we were on track, and things were very good. Uh, the bad news is when they tanked, they've frozen. So from that point, basically, we've seen very little growth. And actually, we've seen probably reductions because they've grown the formula just a little bit, but they pulled it out of transportation. They pulled it out of supplemental programs uh, and asked districts to basically pick up the tab if you're going to continue to do those things. The good news is, economically, last year, we saw a surplus in the state budget for the first time, uh, a significant state, uh, surplus. That conversation generated to be, or that surplus actually generated a lot of conversation around tax cuts uh, and House Bill 253 and some of those things that popped up through the last uh, session. Our argument, obviously, is there's a surplus, there's an obligation that's on the table. The, there's an obligation of somewhere, depending on who you argue with, between $300 and $600 million, $100 million in order to fund the formula that surplus should go to fulfill the obligations that are unmet at this point. So uh, that's our work right now. And actually, uh, in a speech that the board heard and I heard last week, the governor, excuse me, he gets to set the beginning point for the budget. He hands it over to the House uh, as they get ready to start the session. And he said his proposal will include increases in the formula. It won't fund it but it will be a down payment on getting it funded over the next few years, uh, so phase it in again. That's our hope, uh, to be honest, because the board has said since day one, if that state money comes back, we look for the opportunity to actually reduce our local taxes uh, because this is filling the gap right now. If we can do it with the state, let's use their money and not ours. Uh, so I'm slightly hopeful uh, that we are going to see increases in state dollars. Uh, haven't seen them yet, but we're hopeful uh, that the economy is growing at a, at a rate in Missouri uh, that created surplus last year and that some of that surplus will be invested back in K-12 education. So that's what we're pushing for. On the second side, uh, there has been some aggressive work, uh, in, I would say, and I've only been here 15 months, but there's been some aggressive work in the last few years to think about how do we grow the economy of liberty. Uh, obviously, uh, the stamping plant at, at, that Ford uh, has put in is a, is a move, and then there's offshoots of that that are happening in different areas. Uh, those are going to be good things for liberty. The bad news for us is uh, we don't see the immediate benefit because a lot of those come with tax incentives to get those companies to come here. Now, long term, they pay off, but short term, uh, we don't see an immediate benefit. But I understand the cost of doing business sometimes in these uh, competitive, uh, competitive environments from community to community is that we are going to have to give tax incentives to attract business and make that investment so that 
we do get the money long term. So the, the chapter 100s are being used in a different couple different areas. TIFs have been used in the past. Uh, I would tell you that I know there's several other projects being discussed right now, and there's a lot of work by the Liberty Economic Development Corporation to continue to attract people uh, of industry bases to or industry uh, type businesses and science and tech type businesses, uh, so that we can increase that tax base. Because if not, we're going to be continue to be a residential community, and that has high impact on the residential taxpayer. Uh, so we need to support those things. Uh, and we're working to be partners with those things. Uh, obviously, uh, we want to try to get as many upfront dollars as we can along the way, uh, but we understand that we're going to have to partner in some way to attract businesses here. So I would say there's been good things done in the past. There are good things going on right now, uh, and I'm seeing a continual conversation about how do we draw businesses to Liberty uh, that will help with that issue. So. Good, good conversations going on, and I think you'll see uh, some business growth. Uh, you've already seen some business growth, but I think you'll continue to see business growth in the future based on the partnerships that are in place uh, and the aggressive nature of getting industry into this area. So, good questions. Others? Anything else? Dallas, I'm going to turn it back to you to wrap us up. Uh, once again, thank you so much for being here. Uh, if you have friends or neighbors that you want to get information to, uh, please take an extra flyer and uh, direct them to the website or direct them to us, and we will answer any questions that we can. Yes, and to close. I just want to wrap up, and I always have to give my shameless plug, and that would be if you have a smartphone, LPS now has an app that you can go to. Uh, we've seen several thousand already uh, download that app. Just go to your um, uh, app store. Just enter Liberty Public Schools and uh, all the important things that you need to know you can find on that, including an opportunity to not only get information on the November 5th election, but also go to our feedback section. You can ask us uh, any questions that you may have using, using that channel, and we've seen quite a few come in just in the last few weeks. So again, we cannot thank you enough for attending this morning. I want to thank everyone at home for watching. And as Dr. Jungman said earlier, if you ever have any questions, feel free to send them uh, to us directly, and we'll be happy to get them answered for you. So thanks again, and have a great day.